Welcome, Daniel. It's an honor, as always, to sit and talk with you. And I happen to be an investor of Daniel, so I'm extremely biased, just to be clear. But thank you for taking the time, Daniel. Thanks, Rich. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, well, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we'll certainly hit the topic of you know, bias in people and AI and how Checker has used that technology to even further accelerate its business. But just why don't we start out for a second? I, I think. I think when I uh, was in early stage startups, like just understanding the personal story and who the founders were and how they got to the success they had is always an interesting way to start. So Daniel, um, let me just point out to say, you just became an American citizen last week, right? Um, that's awesome. So obviously uh, you didn't start here in the US. So tell us a little bit of the story of why did you come to the US, a little bit about your heritage, and, and then we'll talk about the founding of Checker. Yeah, yeah, no, so I, um, I was born in France, I'm, I'm French. Uh, my parents are immigrants from Syria and Romania, so all over the world, and then um, studied in Europe, and, and I, I moved to the US after college. Um, I don't know, growing up, I always wanted to become an engineer, I was a fan of technology, and the best place for tech is, is always been Silicon Valley, and I uh, always aspired to, to move here, and so I, um, I first, after college, I joined some early stage startups, um, two early stage startups, very early, like seed stage, series A. And that's how I got started uh, in the Valley and, and in tech. And one of those was an early delivery company, right? In the early days of when Instacart and DoorDash were all getting going. So what was it about that experience that helped lead to Checker? Yeah, I mean, it was really great to be an engineer in an early stage startup. I had a lot of exposure to how a startup starts, works, finds customers, build products. Um, and also that gave me and my co-founder, we were both uh, colleagues in the last startup, delivery startup. That's how we found basically the, the problem to tackle and we got the idea to start a new company um, specifically around streamlining background checks and, and building something new there. Um, so I think it's super important. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have had the, this insight and idea to start a company if I wasn't there. And I think for many B2B companies, usually it's someone who has finds a business problem in a real company and then decides to jump and, and build something better. So, so it's about 10 years ago, right, that Checker uh, you know, yeah. went from uh, existence to where you are today. Talk about the journey a little bit of where are you today in size and people and revenue and what were the steps along the way? Yeah, so we started 10 years ago, 2014, um, about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary and started from kind of nothing, nothing just my co-founder and I in, my, in, my, in our bedroom, classic story, and uh, we didn't know anything about HR, background checks, compliance, and uh, yeah, we, we built a new product from scratch. And uh, 10 years later, now we're proud that uh, we have over 100,000 customers, hundreds of million dollars in revenue. And last year, we became global market leader in, in our category of background checks. So it's been an incredible journey going from zero to market leadership. It's, it is awesome. Well, give, it, give us a few examples of the companies that are your customers now. Yeah, so we, we, we serve uh, small customers and big customers. So. Uh, very large companies such as Uber, DoorDash, or Amazon on the high end, but then also we've had a lot of success with small businesses, like any comp small business with one or two employees can just ca go to our website and uh, use the product to sign up with our credit cards and, and, uh, and make a very simple product for them to, to, um, to, to verify their workforce. Yeah. But you know, so I think I'm supposed to say this, or allowed to say this, of like, you know, companies like the Ubers and the Amazons and the Lyfts of the world, the Instacarts, or um, you were actually able to rec recruit those customers at a very early stage of your company's development. Yeah, yeah. So we we started as a as an API company. So we we felt like the background check space was very antiquated, no software, very clunky, slow, manual solutions. Um, so we kind of built from scratch an API and, and a simple app. And we got a lot of traction in the early days with uh, the on-demand economy or like a gig, gig economy. Yeah. So some of our early customers were companies like DoorDash or Instacart, yeah. um, also as part of our Y Combinator network. And we're lucky, you know, I think it's a blessing and a curse to have big customers like this, because on the one side you can really grow fast with them, um, but also as they become bigger company, they become more demanding customers as they should be. Yep. Um, remain very important and key customers for us, yeah. So uh, you're one of the, the absolute leaders in uh, modern HR software, in my assessment. Um, this is an area where AI, you know, the topic we're here to discuss, 
uh, there is some controversy in some ways. Why don't you first just describe at a high level, what are the debates about when AI is appropriate, when it's not appropriate, and how, how does it relate to, to Checker's business? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so we started to use AI in 2018, so before the, the Gen AI wave, um, I, I, I used some NLP and like machine learning in my master thesis and before, and AI is just a great technology to to organize data, to clean up data, to improve accuracy, to do all kinds of things, uh, especially for our product. So it made sense for us to use that under the hood to improve the quality and the accuracy of our data and our product. Um, but unfortunately, especially back in the days, AI was very misunderstood, I think, by, by many businesses and leaders, especially in HR. People were worried about AI. AI was like a bad word you know, tired to bias and to, to be like, okay, AI is scary. We should not use that in recruiting or, or HR because it's biased and can potentially lead to discriminations or, or breaking compliance laws. And so um, in the early days, it was kind of not a good thing to, to use AI or not valued by customers, I would say. Um, I think what's exciting is that now since the Gen AI explosion happened, it became a lot more mainstream and even more worried, you know, industries or buyers such as, such as, such as HR leaders are starting to realize that it, uh, it can be positive, it, you know, it can be leveraged um, to automate things. And uh, it, like any technology, it's only as good as what you deploy it to do and it has risks, um, but it's definitely possible to manage and overcome the bias. Yeah. Um, and it's well, good that well, people are more open to that. Just say, say more about where does the bias come from? If, if you take someone that, you know, is the most, the greatest critic of using this technology in HR, where are they right? Where, is their, where are their concerns about? Yeah, I mean, they're right that humans are biased. Yeah, I think all humans are biased. That's just our nature. We are wired as people to, 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 be, to be biased and to be worried about people who are different than us, et cetera. So there's just like inherent bias in humans. And then a lot of the AI, especially like Gen AI and new AI is trained on the, all the data that's on internet that's created by us you know, biased people are. So as a result, the AI is just learning by watching what people are doing on the internet, which is highly biased. And so if you just like blindly take that mm -hmm. and you put it in charge of like making important decision, like should we hire that person or not, um, it might lead to, to bias on race, gender, and, and other things. So I think that is the right reason to be concerned. It doesn't mean that it can't be manage, measure, overcome, compensated for. So how do you manage that at Checker? I mean, you're one of the most influential HR software companies on this critical topic of assessing people's backgrounds. So how do you manage that at, at Checker? What are the choices you make? Yeah, so we made a few choices. So first, um, in none of our products is the AI deciding for the customer who to get hired or not hired. Um, so the AI is not making decision on a resume, on, an, on a person to interview, to accept them, to move forward. Um, that is one of our principles. Um, we use AI for very specific problems that are more, I would say, neutral. Right. Like for example, cleaning up data or finding um, um, inconsistencies in people's information and flagging this to us. Um, or making sure that identity is well matched. For example, we find records, we have a person's identity applying, we want to make sure that these are the right, the right people and these are the right information. So there are some very specific problems where AI is actually performing much better than, than a human. Yes, yes. Now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, something that is very much uh, what the Checker Foundation spends a lot of time supporting. It's this concept of fair chance hiring. Um, you know, You've all heard about that term or not. Um, let me just start out by asking, as we wade into this topic, like what percent of the U.S. population has some sort of issue or some sort of event in their, in their background check background? Just talk about that and how it affects you know, our society. Yeah, so um, about 80 million Americans, 80 million, which is... Eight oh, zero. Eight zero. zero which is you know, the equivalent of half of the U.S. workforce, has some kind of criminal, ba criminal record. Uh, it can be a DUI, it can be possession of marijuana, it could be some more severe records. Um, so it's very, very widespread. I think that's a shocking statistic. So everyone's like, oh my God, that's, that's really, it is a big number. Um, and so when we discovered that, that you know, we realized that um, there's a lot of people who don't have a perfect background and um, 
we want to help companies understand, you know, what is the risk, but also what are the opportunities and the talent available for jobs. So back to the biased focus, you know, one of our key principles and it's what's part of our mission is this concept of fairness. So we have a design and a company principle of fairness to make sure that we look at fairness, access to opportunities for people as we build products that might be focused on risk and safety, just to have the right counterbalance. Because otherwise, I think uh, potential people analytics or people data company without that guardrail or that principle, it might be tempting sometimes or customer might push you to go into um, you know, too much into risk and fairness that will have a negative impact on helping people uh, getting access to jobs and opportunities. So what's a tangible example of something either the Checker Foundation does or Checker itself to try to allow people that might have made a mistake somewhere in their past to you know, actually have you know, good work opportunities? Yeah, so, so that balance, we bring it into our product. Uh, we believe that the best way for us to drive impact at scale um, is through our customers. We have 100,000 customers. They're hiring millions of people, tens of millions of people every year. And so we want to help the customers finding the right balance for them between risk and safety, but also finding great talent and, and that fairness. And so one example in the product is um, we bring in the product side by side, both like the negative flags or in, in, you know, uh, discrepancies that we found on someone's background with also we give the candidate, the job applicant, the opportunity to share their story. So this way we can bring that data side by side and each customer, each employer can you know, make their own assessment to look at the flags, the potential records, potential mistakes the person has made, but also their story um, that could potentially give some context of what they learned from that, how they took ownership, how they uh, rehabilitated or, or turned their life around and how motivated they might be for, for the specific job. And so what kinds of corporations or customers, whether they're customers of ours or not, what types of corporations have actually adapted these principles of you know, fair chance hiring that you've been evangelizing? Yeah, no, many customers, we're surprised that actually many customers were already doing things like this that are pragmatic on like not discarding and rejecting everyone because they realize that uh, in many industries, there's just not enough workers available. And so you can't find someone that's like has perfect clean background and someone that might have made a mistake can be a great candidate, very motivated. Um, so in a way, we met a lot of customers who were very receptive and show, you know, were seeing the, the business value. Um, some big companies like Aramark, for example, or Grubhub or, or, or DoorDash are, are working and they're leveraging some of those tools to, to find the best uh, the best workforce for their business. You guys yourself have hired a number of people with fair chance backgrounds. I mean, how, how many, if you can say, what percent or how many people at Checker are actually also have things in their backgrounds? Yeah, no, we're proud to be innovators in, in fair chance hiring or second chance hiring, giving second chances. Uh, we partner with nonprofits, we do prison programs, and we help people um, get from prison to jobs in tech. Um, we're proud that we've hired you know, tens of employees, about 5% of our workforce, um, so uh, about 40, 50 uh, employees uh, um, have been formerly incarcerated and now thriving in, in tech, which, which is really cool to see, and we're proud of that. Yeah, for, for, you know, not to be too evangelical about this, but for those of you that are running companies, uh, I, I would actually suggest checking out what's the right site, Fair Chance. Ch Checker.org is our foundation nonprofit. It's free open source content just to help companies um, give second chances and, and, and participate in this movement. And think about what are the policies to make it both safe, but also, you know, uh, make these job opportunities available to people that maybe have made a mistake at, at some point in their past. Um, yeah. Dana, we, we talk about a lot together, you and I, the sort of the 10-year journey. And it's kind of a crazy 10 years in Silicon Valley and in tech. You had, you know, the, obviously the pre-COVID phase, and then you have sort of the, uh, the whole stopping of business and uh, a break in the entire economy. Then you had the zero interest rate stimulants from a lot of governments, and so then the market takes off. And then you have interest rates coming up and you know, the stock market coming back down. It's, it's been a lot of changes this past 10 years. You know, with that backdrop, if you were to give some advice to people, uh, two things. One is, what are the toughest choices you feel like you've had to make as you've had very different weather in this past 10 years? And then what advice would you give someone who's thinking about starting their own business and what are some of the wisdom that you've learned from, from going through those 10 years? 
Yeah, um, lots of changes. It's been a, it's been a crazy ride. Um, I know many of you have made founders potentially in the room. Um, we, you know, we were fortunate that we had like really strong pro product market fit and hyper growth since the early days. Like literally in, in the first six, you know, we got to one million dollar in three months. We got to thirty million dollars in a year and a half. We got to two hundred million dollars in revenue in like three or four years. So like insane hyper growth and scale. It's a blessing and a curse because if you have hyper growth in the early days, then eventually things are going to get harder uh, at some point. And so for us, that's been the story in the last five years. Like that hyper growth eventually slows down, and then you need to work harder um, to compensate for that. You know, the magical period is over. Um, and I would say in, in tech, that's happened for everyone in the last 10, 15 years. Like since I've been in tech, there's been low interest rates, a lot of VC money, overfunded companies. Um, companies burning a ton of cash was okay and, and fine and almost like encouraged. So that has completely reset and changed, uh, you know, in the, in the last year, um, which means that, you know, tech founders and tech employees have to really adapt to a new reality where um, there's just no free lunch or free money available. Like we have to build a very solid profitable business like every other industry in the world, which I don't think is a bad thing, but it's been hard for people who've been in tech and are still going through that transition. If you're starting a company today, I think it's a cool time because it's better to start a company when it's hard now and you know you can only go up from, from there and you're starting in a more frugal, more lean environment and that's the expectation now versus um, you know if you raised a lot of money in the heydays and then now you know it's hard to raise more money or keep up with those valuation expectations. Usually yeah. the, the tough times like right now are uh, usually the best time to start companies. It's pretty exciting. Do you think we're at the bottom of the trough and things are making their way back or, you know, I know, you know, you're not uh, the central banker, but what is your, but you see the labor market, you see yeah. what's happening in terms of hiring. What, what, what is your read of where I, we are? In it's the, funny. We're just, I was just texting with my CFO and my team about that yesterday. I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm too much of an optimist. And so I always have the feeling like, oh, it's just one bad patch and it's going to rebound. It's going to rebound, you know, next year, next quarter. And, and I've been burned by that a few times. And so I think it's better to you know, keep expectations low, uh, assume that it's going to get worse, that it's not going to rebound, and kind of do use that for planning your startup, your company, my company, yeah. rather than hoping for the rebound. Because then if it doesn't happen, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. So I, I don't know what it's like. You know, I, I, I'm optimistic to say that it, it might improve. But it might also stay like this or get worse for next year. Right, right. It's okay. I, I'm, I, I'm like you. I'm an optimist. I do think it'll get better as you look ahead. But I've also been a little bit wrong when I look back to 2022 or 23. Okay, l last question. You know, it's on the topic of AI. Do, do you think um, uh, for your business and then in the industry more, the HR industry more broadly, uh, will AI and all the dialogue and the you know hype or the discussion around it, will it deliver ultimately? Uh, the return on investment and the impact that is you sort of talked about in the press, or do you think it's overhyped when you sort of look look ahead in your product roadmap and, and in your industry? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an investor, so you know better than me, Rich. Um, I do think it's overhyped and overvalued, and it's very hard to differentiate from one AI startup to another and for, for customers and businesses. Um, and I think... AI is going to create amazing business value for, for companies and change, you know, really change the way we work. Um, so I'm, I'm really bullish on AI. I think we're just getting started. Like even the way I look at our 800 employees and how we use AI at work, like we're just starting to leverage it to be more productive, efficient, but I think it, it can do so much more. So I think that's the exciting part. Um, but it is definitely very overhyped and overvalued like right now. So. Um, I think both of those things are true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, those of you, I don't know, the audience, how long we've all been in technology, but I've been around a few cycles, and, you know, it's the classic. There always are hype curves, but I happen to think this is just the next generation of what software is going to be. And so that secular trend has been a very winning secular trend for 30, 40 years. And so I... I uh, even if we have some hype in the short run, yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of impact in the medium run, yeah. uh, without question.
And and then I think you know I don't know you and I like to invest or build kind of like unsexy startups like companies that are working on problems that maybe are not the most exciting that everyone is going after yeah. and uh, that can work with AI too right like you can apply AI as a fantastic technology to solve some problems that maybe you know not general AI not competing with open AI but using AI for a specific vertical or a specific problem something that you are passionate about or expert Great. so maybe that can be the next investment and Agreed. opportunities, yeah. Well, Daniel, congratulations on the Thanks, first Paige. 10 years and the best is yet to come. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>